tonight, an impending indictment. We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. All eyes are on the former president as a grand jury prepares to indict him at any moment on charges relating to the January 6th insurrection as he sought to stave off Joe Biden's election certification. Plus, what clicked into place at that moment? D uh, that 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 feeling of being out of the loop of like why why is this coming natural for everyone else impulsivity just you know might say something or do something that you really uh regret doing a growing number of adults are learning they have autism and their condition has gone untreated for years we go beyond the statistics and meet with the families living with the diagnosis day in and day out and you ever scared of being accepted in the hip-hop community? No, because I came in gay. I came in swinging. It's been 50 years since hip-hop first came on the scene, but for LGBTQ rappers, their acceptance into that community has been a long time coming. Tonight, we bring you their story and celebrate their trailblazing success. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Juju Chang in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more, including new developments on the health of college basketball star and son of LeBron James, Bronny James, as he gets released from the hospital following a cardiac episode. Plus, the latest on what led to that breakdown for Hunter Biden's plea deal. And the economy humming along, interest rates are rising, all while workers are striking. We take a look at this unique economic moment and what it means for you by the numbers. Our correspondents are fanned across the country covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we begin with the mounting legal troubles for former President Trump. As he prepared to face his potentially third criminal indictment today, his lawyers met with special counsel Jack Smith and his team, trying to convince them their client should not be indicted for allegedly trying to stave off his defeat in the 2020 election. Trump calling the meeting productive and repeating that he did nothing wrong. Plus, news just coming in late tonight about the growing scope of the investigation into those classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago. Our teams are covering it all, but we start with ABC senior justice correspondent Pierre Thomas and the new developments in that documents case. Tonight, special counsel Jack Smith bringing new charges in his investigation into the classified documents former President Donald Trump brought with him to Mar-a-Lago when he left the White House. A new figure emerging tonight, a new defendant in the case the head of maintenance at Mar-a-Lago, named Carlos de Oliveira. He's now facing charges, too. The superseding indictment out just moments ago also adds a new count for the former president. He's already facing 37 counts of mishandling classified information and obstruction. He now faces an additional count of willful retention of national defense information and an additional obstruction of justice count. The superseding indictment charges Trump with two new counts based on allegations that he attempted to delete surveillance footage at Mar-a-Lago in summer of 2022. The news comes just hours after Trump staged the last-ditch effort to avoid being indicted in Smith's other investigation, the probe into efforts to overturn the 2020 election, culminating in the riot at the Capitol on January 6th. Former president's attorney sitting down with special counsel Jack Smith at his office in Washington the meeting lasting a bit more than an hour. Trump himself later describing the meeting as productive, saying his team told Smith in detail that I did nothing wrong, was advised by many lawyers, and that an indictment of me would only further destroy our country. It's been 11 days since Trump received a target letter from the special counsel. A clear indication an indictment was imminent. His attorneys today hoping to convince Smith to change course. No word on exactly what was discussed or how the special counsel reacted to their entrees. Our Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas joining me now. Pierre, let's go back to that superseding indictment. Just give us a key line on what we discovered today. Well, this allegedly puts Trump at the center of an obstruction scheme. Clearly, there was surveillance footage, according to the special counsel, that the former president did not want the world to see. And he allegedly instructs people to go delete that footage. And why that would be important is that we know that there is apparently footage of documents being removed from the storage room. And it became clear to the president there was footage that may have existed that showed people removing, removing those documents. He didn't want that to happen, according to the special counsel, and enlisted other people to try to get that footage deleted. This is something with bombshell. Pierre Thomas, we know you'll stay on top of it. Pleasure. Thank you.
So let's bring in ABC News investigative reporter Catherine Falders. Catherine, just break down what we've learned in this new indictment on efforts to destroy surveillance video at Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, we're learning that Special Counsel Jack Smith, who has been investigating the handling of surveillance video at Mar-a-Lago, essentially has put Trump, Walt Nauda, his co-defendant, and then the head of maintenance at the center of this obstruction scheme, specifically as it relates to attempts to destroy surveillance footage. Now, this is important because these attempts happened after a subpoena was sent to the Trump Organization in June of last year, after they received the subpoena for surveillance footage, and then these conversations, which are laid out in the indictment, these conversations happened about how they could delete the video server, for example. You see one portion in this superseding indictment where uh, there's a text message from the head of maintenance to another employee who's not named that said the boss, quote unquote, the boss referring to Trump, wanted the servers deleted. It puts him right at the center of the attempts to destroy this footage and uh, at least acknowledge that he didn't want this, obviously, this footage to go to special counsel Jack Smith. All right, Catherine Falders, thank you. So let's bring our chief Washington correspondent, John Carl. And John, there's a lot of new information. I know you're digging through it right now. I mean, I mean we're going through it all. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and you're saying it, it sort of lays out a pretty brazen set of facts. Uh, I, this is really significant. Uh, the allegation here is not just obstruction of justice, not just uh, trying to delete evidence, but it's doing so immediately after the evidence was subpoenaed. So on uh, June 24th of last year, uh, the Justice Department subpoenaed the Trump, Trump and the Trump Organization for the surveillance footage, footage, uh, footage at Mar-a-Lago. And according to this indictment, Walt Nauta, of course, was you know Donald Trump's uh, you know personal valet. Walt Nauta it, uh, had already faced an indictment in the first round. Um, and, and what Walt Nauta travels wherever Trump goes. He was supposed to be uh, traveling to Illinois. The, the subpoena comes in. The, according to this, his travel plans are canceled, and he is sent instead to Mar-a-Lago, where he meets with the head of maintenance at Mar-a-Lago and allegedly goes with him to try to delete the surveillance footage, the very surveillance footage that the previous day had been subpoenaed by the Justice Department. And is that the quote from employee number four? Uh, uh, employee, so what, what happens is uh, Walt Nauta gets to Mar-a-Lago, meets with the head of maintenance, they go to where the surveillance video is held, and they talk to employee number four. We don't know who employee number four oh, is, right. but I bet they want to know, uh, the Trump team, exactly who employee number four is. Because according to employee number four, um, the head of maintenance comes in and says the boss wants the server deleted. And employee number four, according to this, says he doesn't know if he can do that, if he has the rights to do that. And then, again, the head of maintenance repeats. Uh, the boss wanted the server deleted. What are we going to do? Uh, very significant to see not just, again, potential evidence attempted to be destroyed, but done immediately following a subpoena asking for that very evidence. In some ways, no mistaking that kind of action. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the allegations are clear. That is obstruction of justice if they, can, if they can establish that that's, in fact, what happened. But the timeline... I have to tell you, is very detailed. And one thing that they must be wondering uh, at the Trump camp is who provided all of this detail, somebody very much on the inside, perhaps this employee number four. The so-called employee number four. Yep. John Carl, as always, thank you. And I know we'll be learning a lot more yes. from what we're seeing. Yep. Thank, you. thank you. And now to the other legal battle gripping Washington and the new details emerging on that stalled plea deal for President Biden's son, Hunter. One day after a judge questioned the plea agreement and put it on hold. So what exactly was it that raised her concern? And tonight, the White House was asked if the president would pardon his son if he were to be convicted. Here's ABC's senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. One day after the stunning collapse of Hunter Biden's plea deal with federal prosecutors, his father, the president, facing a stark and now possibly relevant question. Mr. President, are you considering pardoning your son? Are you considering pardoning your son? While President Biden didn't answer, the White House press secretary did. Is there any possibility that the president would end up pardoning his son? No. Hunter Biden once again living in a legal limbo under investigation for five years and that plea deal negotiated for months by his lawyers and a Trump-appointed lead prosecutor now in doubt after federal judge Mary Ellen Noriega, also appointed by Trump, refused to sign off on it yesterday. 
Today, the terms of that deal were revealed, Politico obtaining a copy of it and a source authenticating it for ABC. The document describes the huge sums Hunter Biden was earning from his overseas business dealings in Ukraine, China, and Romania, noting that Hunter continued to earn handsomely and spend wildly, making some $2.6 million in 2018 alone, spending almost all of it that year while in the throes of addiction. The key problem that led the judge to derail the deal? Paragraph 15, immunity, where prosecutors agree not to prosecute Biden for any federal crimes relating to the facts investigators had uncovered. When Judge Noriega asked if the president's son would be immune from prosecution for other possible crimes, including any related to his foreign business dealings, the prosecutor said no. But Biden's lawyer then threatening to rip up the deal. Both sides seeing their long-fought negotiations fall apart in front of their eyes in dramatic fashion. Judge Noriega insisting she wouldn't be a rubber stamp on their agreement. Hunter Biden eventually pleading not guilty for now. And Terry Moran joins me now. Terry, where does all this stand right now? It's a mess. It's a hot mess, to use a legal term, Juju. I mean, it's clear uh, that the judge will not accept the deal as it stands. And so it's back to the drawing board, but that may not be easy. Hunter Biden wants to put all his legal problems behind him in this deal. But prosecutors say this investigation remains open. That's a hard bridge to cross there. And so what the judge has done is given both sides 30 days to talk, find ways to address her concerns, and forge a new deal if they can. To clean up this hot mess. What a great legal term of art, Terry Moran, as always. Thank you. And also in Washington, Senator, Senate Minority Leader, rather, Mitch McConnell, back on Capitol Hill today, insisting he's doing fine one day after an alarming moment raised concerns about his health. One aide claims McConnell was feeling lightheaded when he suddenly froze, appearing unable to speak before being led away from his news conference yesterday. Sources tell ABC News that McConnell also fell two weeks ago and occasionally uses a wheelchair to get around. And the Northeast is now under a severe thunderstorm watch, causing the FAA to reroute flights. This is the nation's largest power grid issued an energy emergency alert in 13 states. Let's get straight to ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano. Rob, how are you? Juju, we just went through a little uh, little pulse here of some action. You mentioned the severe thunderstorms here in the Northeast. We've got that watch up. We had a tornado reported in New Hampshire, a lot of damage reported in southern Massachusetts and here in Connecticut. And that watch, we still got a couple more hours to deal with, but it looks like uh, nothing too too terrible at the moment. Uh, northern Wisconsin, you're in it for a little bit longer, as you as you are you in, in Minnesota. And these have obviously brought down some trees, so just be aware it could be some power outages. Is this a cold front? You wish, right? No. The heat's back on tomorrow, coast to coast. Heat advisories up, even more warnings for the mid uh, Midwest. 103 in Columbia, come on, 104. Measured in the shade in, in Manhattan, Kansas, and 100 degrees expected in D.C. It looks like we'll see another day on Saturday, and then a real cold front comes through, thankfully, cooling things off on Sunday. Stay cool, Juju. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate you. Have a and next tonight, school shooter Ethan Crumley is asking a judge to spare him from a sentence of life in prison without parole. Now 17 years old, he pleaded guilty to killing four students and wounding seven other people in Oxford, Michigan in 2021. Today in court, prosecutors read from his journal entry the night before the shooting, and it's chilling. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, prosecutors making the case that Ethan Crumley, the teenager who killed four people inside his Michigan high school, should spend the rest of his life in prison. This defendant made the decision to kill four other people and to take their lives instead of his own. The 17-year-old sitting in the courtroom, not looking up for much of his sentencing hearing. He has pleaded guilty to more than two dozen charges, including murder and terrorism. Prosecutors presenting evidence showing how Crumley allegedly planned the attack ahead of the November 2021 shooting. The courtroom listening to recordings made by Crumley the night before the shooting. The name is Ethan Crumley, aged 15, and I'm going to be the next school shooter. A handwritten journal recovered from Crumley's backpack in a school bathroom. In it, Crumley writing, I am fully committed to this now. I am going to prison for life. And surveillance video capturing Crumley and his mother at a shooting range just three days before the shooting. 
Juju, Crumley's parents have been charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter for their alleged role in buying that gun. They have pleaded not guilty. Today, the defense arguing that sentencing Crumley to life without parole is too severe and that he is not irreparably corrupt. The hearing resumes tomorrow. Juju. And next tonight, a Colorado sheriff's deputy will not be charged for using a taser on a fleeing suspect who then ran into the street and was ultimately hit and killed by incoming traffic. The district attorney's office has released body camera video of the incident and a warning. It is disturbing. ABC's Mola Lange reports from Colorado. Tonight, newly released police body camera video shows the moment a traffic stop turned deadly when a man, first tased by a sheriff's deputy, was then hit by an SUV. Authorities in Laramere County, Colorado, say around 9 p.m. on February 18th, Deputy Lorenzo Lujan pulled over this car driven by 28-year-old Brent Thompson after noting its suspicious behavior at a nearby hotel. The reason why I'm stopping you is your registration's expired. Authorities say Thompson appeared nervous and gave them a false name. Lujan attempting to place him under arrest after learning he had a revoked license. Thompson then taking off on foot. The deputy firing his taser, Thompson falling onto a road where he was fatally struck by an oncoming SUV, later pronounced dead at a hospital. The district attorney declined to press charges against the deputy, but saying he used poor and ultimately tragic judgment. But tonight, Thompson's family demanding justice. This is death, and there should be some um, repercussion of his actions, I believe. Well, police say they found a gun and drugs in Thompson's car in a toxicology report showing fentanyl and other drugs in his system, Juju. Malalengi, thank you. Chaos in Niger after supporters of a coup set fire to the headquarters of the ruling party. Cars were set ablaze as the army command declared its backing for the takeover carried out by soldiers of the presidential guard. The soldiers said in a late night televised address that the president had been stripped of power and the republic's institutions suspended, marking the seventh coup in West and Central Africa since 2020. Well, LeBron James's son, Bronny, is out of the hospital three days after suffering a cardiac arrest during basketball practice at USC. The 18-year-old's doctor saying he's showing encouraging signs of recovery. LeBron James posted a message thanking friends and fans for their support, saying, quote, we have our family together, safe and healthy. Still much more to get to here on Prime. The mayor of Uvalde, who became the face in the search for answers after the Robb Elementary mass shooting, is stepping down. The role he is running for next. Up next, the growing number of adults learning that they are living with autism. My conversation with reality star TV star Demi Burnett about her late diagnosis. What clicked into place at that moment? D uh, that that, that feeling of being out of the loop of like, why, why is this coming natural for everyone else? Impulsivity, just, you know, might say something or do something that you really uh, regret doing. here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When many of us think of autism and an initial diagnosis, we think of children. But a growing number of adults are learning they have autism too. And the condition has gone untreated for years. I sat down with families living with the diagnosis day in and day out to go beyond the statistics. This cabinet, I feel like, is the star of the show in the kitchen. Stardom and fame, everything Demi Burnett dreamed of. I can transform myself into a 10, you know? But it was her on-screen antics on The Bachelor. I will happily accept your rose. That made her famous. Ladies, the queen is back! Her acting out, also drawing eyes on Bachelor in Paradise. Would there be anyone there who doesn't know who I am? That's a joke. But behind the scenes, Demi was grappling with autism and didn't know it. Ah, I'm so mortified! God! What? do people not know about you from what they've seen publicly? I'm really known for like being so bold and confident and like if someone confronts me, I, I could handle it and stuff. But I really don't like that kind of stuff. It's a performance. Yeah, for the theater. It's an act. It's, it's all a bit. an act. It's a performance to save your life though because like <laughs> it's, it's necessary. Demi says that performance helped her navigate a crippling social anxiety she could never understand. She says she initially self-medicated by abusing alcohol. I sobered up. It was like six months after, and I had been struggling with being on the same page as people, like them misunderstanding me and or me misunderstanding them. Last year, an autism diagnosis suddenly put things into perspective for the 28-year-old. What clicked into place at that moment? D uh, that, that, that feeling of being out of the loop of like, why, why is this coming natural for everyone else? Impulsivity, just, you know, might say something or do something that you really uh, regret doing. And so why do you feel like you want to speak out about it and be public about it? I want to be able to provide like that space for people to relate and uh, not feel like alone in this or not feel stupid about it. Demi is one of a growing number of people getting diagnosed with autism as adults. Autism is characterized by challenges and differences in social interaction and communication, preferences for routine, repetition, as well as sensory sensitivities. Of the 5.4 million adults living with autism, some get diagnosed as kids, and others reach adulthood before ever recognizing signs of their neurodivergence. Also speaking out, celebrities like chandelier singer Sia. Recently discussing her autism on Rob Has a Podcast. 45 years I was like, I've got to go put my human suit on. And only in the last two years have I become my, like, fully, fully myself. Prominent athletes like former NFL player Joe Barksdale and former NBA player Tony Snell also revealing their diagnoses. And actor Wentworth Miller went decades not knowing he had autism until 2020 at the age of 48. Those who might have average or above average intellectual ability might kind of fly under the radar or be able to mask some of their symptoms. And also, we sometimes see more adult diagnoses as more children are getting diagnosed. For Demi, her diagnosis brought the relief she was desperate for. Way back in college, she actually suspected she might have autism. What were your social interactions like that gave you the feeling that, oh, maybe I am? 
It's not like there's a specific social interaction. There's just this like feeling of oh, like uh, anxiety of like um, I need to put on the show, like put on the mask of like, oh, I'm a person who functions and does things. Hi, how are you? But I think that the mask is uh, very protective because you can't be your true self in the real world sometimes because we have been ourselves and there were negative reactions that traumatized us. When Demi watches herself on The Bachelor, okay. she says she can see beyond the mask she was wearing. Can I interrupt? So here you here. grab him. Yes. I want to show you something. All right. Watch how people automatically get upset with me. We're going to go upstairs. Oh my God, are you kidding me? Why, yeah. what? It may seem like an ordinary reality yeah. TV yeah. moment, but Demi says she was struggling with social cues and anxiety. That's not me trying to like get, do a gimmick. That was a moment of pure autistic like isolation for no reason, like uh, misunderstanding, misreading. I'm in fight or flight until I'm done talking to Colton every single time. She's now begun to live in a way that's more comfortable for her, doing what's called unmasking. Unmasking refers to the idea of kind of allowing yourself to be yourself, essentially. If you feel like you need to rock or use some sort of sensory accommodations, that's like energy focused on um, trying to, to hide those autism symptoms. Demi's headphones give her a noise buffer she says she needs. Subtle, repetitive movements calm her. Painting eases her anxiety. Hi, baby. But her biggest source of support and comfort is her dog, Sandor. My dog regulates me. One of the biggest things that I need is like another nervous system to like let me know that I'm safe. Demi has begun chronicling her journey on social media. My mornings are like this. I wake up, 30 seconds of bliss, the demands hit me. As an autistic person, I can be sensory seeking, so the more that people talk about being autistic, it means that the less that we have to hide that part of ourselves. Joining a growing community of men and women. But it also can make us like not really want to be around people. Hey, Maxie. Hey, Maxie. Guess how many followers you have on TikTok? who are showing how they're living with autism. Might as well be like really open with it on my social media and stuff and just change the stigmas around it. I've always known I was a tinge different. What's important about finding out that you're autistic, it removes this idea that you're weird and it puts it in a spot where you can say, oh, I'm autistic and it's okay for me to need these things. Last December, shortly after being diagnosed with ADHD, Chelsea Potts was diagnosed with autism at the age of 33. Multiple girls, especially girls of color, have been missed throughout the years because we were never included in what would be considered the criteria for autism. We see it most often in women and in people of color. Women might be a little bit more prone to masking um, as one reason. And also, historically, autism was really thought of as kind of a male disorder. Well, I did buy one thing. I bought some rocks. Chelsea's daughter, Kennedy, is also autistic. Both Kennedy and her twin, Braylon, have ADHD. Kennedy's diagnosis came after Chelsea's. Once I realized I had autism, I was like, oh, oh. It was hard because she's 10, so I look back to the time where she would freak out when we would go to places, and I'm like, oh, just get it together. Why can't we just have a, a nice trip? And I never thought about, like, what does she need? Even as I speak about it now, it makes me emotional because that's my baby, and I didn't, I just didn't, I didn't notice, I didn't notice. Oh, no, 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 no seriously, look. What? On a visit to the Cincinnati Zoo with her 10-year-old twins, it's clear Chelsea is determined to help her daughters navigate the world. Look, look, look. They look weird. No one from the outside can see what they're up against. Nope, it's a sensory map. So this can tell us where the areas are really loud, where they're really crowded. So if we don't want to be around a whole lot of people, we can avoid those. Can uh, is there any place you want to avoid? I don't want to go to a crowded location. Okay, well, I have to put on these glasses. Chelsea because... is already in sensory overload. My head is starting to hurt. Why? I don't know. It's like, it's loud and it's hot. Kennedy is having a crisis of her own. You getting tired? Yeah. Okay. Their family stopping by the zoo's calming room for a moment of quiet. Oh. 
I'm just relaxing and taking it in. I don't know. It feels soft. And seeing Kennedy takes Chelsea back to her own childhood. I think getting diagnosed as a kid can help you advocate for your needs a lot early and practice that in a much safer environment. Whereas when you're diagnosed as an adult, then you're really going back and you're rethinking your whole life. As an adult, Chelsea has thrived professionally. She's an assistant dean at Miami University in Ohio. But work is still a challenge. Communication is a minefield. My words are usually jumbled. So a lot of times I will leave conversations with regrets. Chelsea considers herself lucky. Studies suggest that up to 75% of adults with autism are underemployed. There are so many gaps in what we have available for autistic adults. It's nowhere near it needs to be. People describe it as falling off a services cliff. Um, there's really not many opportunities for individuals, and especially, um, you know, for individuals who are creative, which is an area we specialize in. Heidi Stieglitz Ham created Spectrum Fusion in Houston, a nonprofit that provides services and a sense of community to adults with autism. We want it to be for all levels. Yeah, all levels. The group also employs people in video production. There's a stereotype of individuals on the spectrum that excel in math and science, but we have the rest of the spectrum to consider. 25-year-old John Carl Barth is one of the participants. I had a terrible experience in school and I studied video production. So I dropped out there and I had no degree and no prospects seemingly. And now against all odds, I actually have a job in a field I want to work in. This is a workplace that is very much made with adults on the spectrum in mind, which most jobs in any field aren't. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of stuff in here. For Demi, success in her field looks like being her most authentic Nova. self. What do you want for Demi's future? I want to be able to exist and not have to, like, you know, be so frantic about how to survive all the time. Look at the penguin. Back in Ohio, Chelsea wants the same for her family. When I think about my daughters, I want them to be able to really, really love themselves. Sometimes we don't think about how we have been socialized to do certain things. Am I really that different? Or am I just coming from a different perspective? And we have still much more to get to. Coming up, labor disputes are on the rise, and so are opportunities for artificial intelligence specialists. A closer look at our changing economic times by the numbers. Plus, representation in hip hop. ABC News Live takes a look at the influence LGBTQ plus artists have brought to the genre, then and now. And what I've been through rapping, what I've seen my mama go through rapping, what I've seen my Cousins go through. I grew up around nothing but girls. So I rap from a female standpoint. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! Somebody if I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody save me. I love you. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes, escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This this is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. The country's economy remains strong despite the highest interest rates in decades. Yet labor disputes are on the rise as concerns about protections for workers mount. Tonight, we have a look at these economic times by the numbers. Gross domestic product grew at a 2.4% pace in the second quarter. The Commerce Department reported today that's faster than expected. And inflation slowed to 2.6%. The news quells recession concerns as the Federal Reserve continues to raise interest rates, now at their highest level in 22 years. Yet the positive numbers don't seem to equal good times for everyone. Labor disputes over protections for workers are on the rise, perhaps most prominently the more than 170,000 actors and writers on strike. 87% of actors earn less than $26,000 a year. Hollywood executives say it's not realistic to pay more. At the same time, studios appear to be on a hiring spree for specialists in just the kinds of AI applications the striking actors fear will cost them jobs. Netflix has posted an AI manager position paying up to $900,000 a year. Disney, the parent company of ABC, is looking for an AI engineer with a base salary of $180,000 a year, while Amazon is offering up to $300,000 for a prime video AI job. There you have it, these economic times, picket lines, anxiety amid growing wealth, and a final note, ABC News parent company Disney is a member of the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers who are negotiating with the striking actors and writers unions. And we have much more ahead here on Prime. Springing into action, the amazing moments when a FedEx driver helped rescue a stranger from a burning car. Plus, they performed life-saving historic surgeries on conjoined twin boys. Groundbreaking doctors exclusively talking to ABC News about the seemingly impossible separation. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? 
going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. A new mayor in town? Well, a hero FedEx driver and a former reggaeton power couple taking to social media to squash any rumors of infidelity. Those stories and more in tonight's Rundown. After leading his town through the horror of the attack at Robb Elementary School, the mayor of Uvalde, Texas, is stepping down. Uvalde Mayor Don McLaughlin was the face of his community's frustrating search for answers about the police response to last year's Robb Elementary School massacre. We realize you still don't have the answers that you need, and it's frustrating to all of us. For that, I apologize. After the slaughter of 19 students and two teachers, McLaughlin himself took some of the heat. Running as a Republican, McLaughlin will vie for a seat in the Texas House of Representatives. A special election will be held for mayor in November. One of the candidates is Kimberly Mata Rubio, the mother of Lexi Rubio, who was among the children killed in the shooting. A Memphis, Tennessee suburb has gone a week without being able to use tap water. Officials telling residents in Germantown don't use the water for drinking or washing from July 20th after diesel fuel from a treatment plant generator leaked into a reservoir. 40,000 residents told to only use water to flush toilets and otherwise use bottled water for everything else. Still no timeline on when that water may be safe again. A brutal attack caught on camera in Ohio. Cleveland police arresting 12 juveniles after claims they brutally beat a 34-year-old man at a gas station Tuesday morning. All of it caught on a surveillance camera. Officials say the teens punched the man repeatedly and pointed guns at him before he ran inside the gas station. 12 suspects ranged in age from 12 to 17. 11 were brought to a juvenile detention center. 
California FedEx driver being called a hero for saving a man in a burning car. Jonathan Rohrbeck was in the middle of his overnight shift when he saw the car had veered off the road Wednesday. Rohrbeck was the first on the scene, helped bring the injured driver out of the car before it became fully engulfed. He also used a fire extinguisher to help keep the fire down for some time before returning to the injured driver. They're still investigating what caused that crash. The driver is in the hospital with major non-life-threatening injuries. Anheuser-Busch plans to lay off several hundred corporate workers months after Bud Light's partnership with Dylan Mulvaney created controversy. The company telling ABC News the layoffs would affect fewer than 2% of the company and would not involve frontline workers, including warehouse staff, drivers, and salespeople. Bud Light's brief partnership with Mulvaney in April set off a massive boycott from conservatives, which caused sales of the beer to drop significantly. Former reggaeton power couple Rao Alejandro and Rosalia are breaking their silence after rumors of infidelity surfaced immediately after the news of their engagement ending. Rao Alejandro on Instagram denied any infidelity, while Rosalia said she loves and respects Rao, adding, we know what we've lived. And tonight, an exclusive interview with the doctors behind an historic surgery. They separated three-year-old brothers who were conjoined at the head. Those surgeons spoke to only Arcana Wentworth about the groundbreaking procedure. Three-year-old twins, Pedro and Augusto, had a bleak future. They're really intellectually more like 18-month-olds. Born in Guatemala and conjoined at the head. Yeah, that really is just not a good quality of life. But they also shared an unbreakable spirit one that was matched by a team of specialists at Dayton Children's Hospital in Ohio. Dr. Christopher Gordon and Dr. Robert Lober speaking exclusively with GMA. They assembled a dream team of medical professionals to try and give the twins a fighting chance. We had lots of talks with the mom about the potential for injury, to be in wheelchairs, to be debilitated, to lose your life on the table. In a historic feat, over four months, doctors performed three major surgeries to separate the veins and arteries, which the hospital documented in the film Connected, the story of the seemingly impossible separation of Pedro and Augusto. It took so many different surgeries, rerouting each kid's blood flow to uh, themselves. Right, and we wanted to give them time to to get used to that new blood flow. I mean, they were right at the edge of organ failure just from the changes in load as we did each stage. So I think if we tried to do more of this at once, they probably wouldn't have made it. At last, it was time for the final separation. But it didn't go as planned. Not only were the boys' frontal lobes connected, but they discovered yet another large artery shared by the boys. Severing it would cause injury, and their little bodies couldn't take much more anesthesia. It's the biggest surgery of your career. You're questioning your ability to complete it. And now you're racing against the clock as well. It took a personal toll. It took a toll on everyone in the room. Everybody was suffering. I learned later that a nurse was crying because, you know, we were all feeling it. And someone told her, step out. Dr. Lober can't see that. You know, I, need, I needed all the encouragement I could get. Eventually, after three days in the operating room, the boys were apart. Cerebral separation, yeah. five or 43. What was that moment like when the tables moved apart? Surreal. The thing was, it wasn't over. With a long road ahead and skills to relearn and more reconstructive work, the twins finally got to go home 14 months after the separation. These were boys that we'd come to love over a long period of time. Everybody had come to love. They became our boys. <laughs> Just extraordinary. We turn now to Little Alms X, to Cardi B, to Frank Ocean, all of them queer rappers who've long dominated the world of hip hop, breaking barriers one beat at a time. As ABC News Live marks 50 years of hip hop, ABC News' Roxy Diaz uncovers how different generations of LGBTQ plus rappers have helped mold the industry today. So what the boys jump to about? You don't even know. What you doing? Not about to get ready for my show. Gays really just have so much influence, and people don't want to put us to the forefront, so I feel like that's my job. What's your right
LGBTQ plus community has long dominated the hip hop industry. And right now, Saucy Santana is at the forefront. We just need to be visible. A lot of times, gay is behind the scenes. Stellar hits like Material Bra! Booty! Give it up for the one and the only, Saucy Santana! Saucy joins Lil Nas X, Cardi B, Frank Ocean, and Young M.A., all queer rappers unapologetically themselves. With uninhibited and vulgar lyrics, Saucy has infiltrated the industry, like emerging with hits like Walk 'em Like a Dog. I'm at the clubs and they was playing the freestyle at the clubs. I recorded Walk 'em Like a Dog in Orlando. I put it out July 4th on SoundCloud and it did a million streams in a week. You're an openly gay rapper. Mm -hmm. When Lil Nas X had his issues and his story came out that he was gay mm -hmm. and it seemed like a battle for him to be accepted, were you ever scared of being accepted in the hip hop community? No, cause I came in gay. I came in swinging. Yeah. <laughs> In the song Material Girl, Saucy Santana expresses his femininity. Rapping what I've been through, rapping what I've seen my mama go through, rapping what I've seen my cousins go through. I grew up around nothing but girls. So I rap from a female standpoint. <laughs> He's also well known for his media presence. I bring water for our money. <laughs> his clapbacks, merciless. <laughs> Saucy Santana joined forces with rapper IDK for the single Pinot Noir, a collaboration of two artists hoping to break stigmas in the world of rap. The rapper IDK got some backlash. IDK posted a tweet in which he said, I don't have to be a gay rapper to feature a gay rapper on a track with me. Him collaborating with me don't have nothing to do with him, what he like or what he have going on. All the hate dismissed by the decades of work put in by queer artists who have heavily influenced different styles of rap today. In the 80s, hip hop practitioners are really eager to assert that hip hop is not just a youth fad, that it's really an all encompassing culture. There's this desire to sort of distance that from other iterations like disco or house music, other styles of black dance music that are more closely associated with queer communities. What we start to see is little pockets of queer artists in their particular communities. I say YMM, they love them. Katie Red was the first transgender bounce artist known for songs like Where the Mouth At. It was heterosexual females and heterosexual males who didn't like the fake that I was doing my thing. In the early 2000s, bounce music in New Orleans has openly queer and trans artists like Sissy Noby, Katie Red, Big Frida. Katie Red, the first transsexual to come out with bounce music in 1998. Katie was my sister and I started helping her. Big Frida is one of the queer artists credited with helping popularize bounce music. I started doing my own solo thing and things just kept on moving. The gender fluid icon has transcended music genres today. Even one of her rap verses was used in Beyonce's single, Break My Soul. She's talking about, you know, release this romantic or sexual partner who's maybe straight passing, very masculine type of man. So audiences, depending on their familiarity with different queer cultures, may or may not understand all of those specific codes, but it's still reaching those audiences. Today, queer rappers are challenging societal and gender norms, lyrically and visually. Lil Nas X's video, Montero, Call Me By Your Name, is particularly interesting. He takes these tropes that have been used to attack LGBTQ people for a really long time. He reframes them. I think it's particularly true of women artists as well because they're already, I don't want to say vulnerable, but can already be the target of sexism. 
Cardi B has been accused of queer baiting. And because there are so many stereotypes about promiscuity and such associated with bisexuality, this is particularly challenging for women rappers. When somebody sees somebody who's actually queer, like they treat me worse when it's like, but you were okay with two straight girls making out for the shock value, but when you see someone like me, it's like, you know, a problem. Rap was a way to express yourself. First it started off freestyles, and then it kind of became like, oh shoot, I think I could write a song. Yeah. I like the Mexican rap ratchet Hannah Montana. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's only what looks good on camera. Like, don't That's it. <laughs> There's not another job that I would have the opportunity to also give other people opportunities like this. At the beginning, when I did this track like called Holy Stuff, this white girl can't go far. She can't mess with a people. I guess we gonna see. Cause... People were just like, oh, who's this white girl? Like, why, 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 all this stuff? And I was just like, bro, like, I'm Mexican. We had a whole president literally sitting there disrespecting our people. So to me, I'm just like, well, then I'm gonna be loud about it. The same way that I'm loud about being gay. In the music video for her song, Piña, Latin Grammy-nominated artist Snow, the product, removes the male gaze from the visuals. A song like Piña that is bilingual, that's about queer relationships between two women. Have a good show. She really is pulling all of these issues and showing how interconnected they are. <laughs> A lot of us grew up more impoverished situations and in, you know, people of color, we have a lot of, like, things that we want to say about, like, generational issues that we've had for so long that when we finally break that cycle and we're the black sheep because we break that cycle, everyone looks at us like we're the problem. Can you light it up, turn your light so flashlights Creating a community as she steps into the spotlight to sing at her show in New York. It's a special moment shared with fans that become like family. I'm proud of the entire thing. For Snow and for Saucy, it's doing what they love no matter who they love. That really matters. I came in being myself, and I feel like that's what has gotten me this far, being Santana. And I think taking everything in stride, even though you can look at me any way, I think I'm pretty positive because I've made something of myself when I didn't think I even could. Well done. And that's our show for this hour. I'm Gigi Chang. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, a teen girl is reunited with her family nearly four years after vanishing from her home. The details surrounding her sudden return. A coup declared in Niger. What's next as soldiers overthrow the democratically elected president? This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Juju Chang in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to this evening, including Donald Trump now charged with possession of a classified document that he's previously heard discussing on an audio tape. What that means for his other looming investigations. Plus, what exactly was at the center of that Hunter Biden plea agreement and its sudden last minute failure? And the coup taking place in Niger as its military announces it's taken over its president. But we begin with the mounting legal troubles for former President Trump as he prepared to face his potentially third criminal indictment today. His lawyers met with special counsel Jack Smith and his team trying to convince them their client should not be indicted for allegedly trying to stave off his defeat in the 2020 election. Trump is calling the meeting productive and repeating that he did nothing wrong. Plus, news coming in late tonight about the growing scope of the investigation into those classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago. Our teams are covering it all, but we start with ABC's senior justice correspondent Pierre Thomas and the new developments in that documents case. Tonight, special counsel Jack Smith bringing new charges in his investigation into the classified documents former President Donald Trump brought with him to Mar-a-Lago when he left the White House. A new figure emerging tonight, a new defendant in the case, the head of maintenance at Mar-a-Lago, named Carlos de Oliveira. He's now facing charges, too. The superseding indictment out just moments ago also adds three new felony counts against the former president. He had already been facing 37 counts of mishandling classified information. Now he faces an additional count of willful retention of national defense information and two additional obstruction of justice charges. The superseding indictment charges Trump with two new counts based on allegations that he attempted to delete surveillance footage at Mar-a-Lago in summer of 2022. The news comes just hours after Trump staged the last dish effort to avoid being indicted in Smith's other investigation, the probe into efforts to overturn the 2020 election, culminating in the riot at the Capitol on January 6th. Former president's attorney sitting down with special counsel Jack Smith at his office in Washington the meeting lasting a bit more than an hour. Trump himself later describing the meeting as productive, saying his team told Smith in detail that I did nothing wrong, was advised by many lawyers, and that an indictment of me would only further destroy our country. It's been 11 days since Trump received a target letter from the special counsel. A clear indication an indictment was imminent. 
his attorneys today hoping to convince Smith to change course. No word on exactly what was discussed or how the special counsel reacted to their entrees. So let's bring in ABC News investigative reporter Catherine Falders. Catherine, just break down what we've learned in this new indictment on efforts to destroy surveillance video at Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, we're learning that Special Counsel Jack Smith, who has been investigating the handling of surveillance video at Mar-a-Lago, essentially has put Trump, Walt Nauda, his co-defendant, and then the head of maintenance at the center of this obstruction scheme, specifically as it relates to attempts to destroy surveillance footage. Now, this is important because these attempts happened after a subpoena was sent to the Trump Organization in June of last year, after they received the subpoena for surveillance footage. And then these conversations, which are laid out in the indictment, these conversations happened about how they could delete the video server, for example. You see one portion in this superseding indictment where uh, there's a text message from the head of maintenance to another employee who's not named that said the boss, quote unquote, the boss referring to Trump, wanted the servers deleted. It puts him right at the center of the attempts to destroy this footage and uh, at least acknowledge that he didn't want this, obviously, this footage to go to special counsel Jack Smith. All right, Catherine Falders, thank you. So let's bring our chief Washington correspondent, John Carl. And John, there's a lot of new information. I know you're digging through it right now. I mean, I mean we're going through it all. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and you're saying it, it sort of lays out a pretty brazen set of facts. Uh, I, this is really significant. Uh, the allegation here is not just obstruction of justice, not just uh, trying to delete evidence, but it's doing so immediately after the evidence was subpoenaed. So on uh, June 24th of last year, uh, the Justice Department subpoenaed the Trump, Trump and the Trump Organization for the surveillance footage, footage, uh, footage at Mar-a-Lago. And according to this indictment, Walt Nauta, of course, was you know Donald Trump's uh, you know personal valet. Walt Nauta uh, had already faced an indictment in the first round. Um, and, and what Walt Nauta travels wherever Trump goes. He was supposed to be uh, traveling to Illinois. The, the subpoena comes in. The, according to this, his travel plans are canceled, and he is sent instead to Mar-a-Lago, where he meets with the head of maintenance at Mar-a-Lago and allegedly goes with him to try to delete the surveillance footage, the very surveillance footage that the previous day had been subpoenaed by the Justice Department. And is that the quote from employee number four? Uh, uh, employee, so what, what happens is uh, Walt Nauta gets to Mar-a-Lago, meets with the head of maintenance, they go to where the surveillance video is held, and they talk to employee number four. We don't know who employee number four oh, is, right. but I bet they want to know uh, the Trump team exactly who employee number four is, because according to employee number four, um, the head of maintenance comes in and says the boss wants the server deleted. And employee number four, according to this, says he doesn't know if he can do that, if he has the rights to do that. And then again, the head of maintenance repeats. Uh, the boss wanted the server deleted. What are we going to do? Uh, very significant to see not just, again, potential evidence attempted to be destroyed, but done immediately following a subpoena asking for that very evidence. In some ways, no mistaking that kind of action. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the allegations are clear. That is obstruction of justice if they, can, if they can establish that that's, in fact, what happened. But the timeline... I have to tell you, is very detailed. And one thing that they must be wondering uh, at the Trump camp is who provided all of this detail, somebody very much on the inside, perhaps this employee number the four. The so-called employee number four. Yep. John Carl, as always, thank you. And I know we'll be learning a lot more yes. from <laughs> what we're seeing. Yeah. Thank you. And now to the other legal battle gripping Washington and the new details emerging on that stalled plea deal for President Biden's son, Hunter. A day after a judge questioned the agreement and put it on hold, what was it that raised her concern? And tonight, the White House was asked if the president would pardon his son if he were to be convicted. Here's ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran. One day after the stunning collapse of Hunter Biden's plea deal with federal prosecutors, his father, the president, facing a stark and now possibly relevant question. Mr. President, are you considering pardoning your son? Are you considering pardoning your son? 
While President Biden didn't answer, the White House press secretary did. Is there any possibility that the president would end up pardoning his son? No. Hunter Biden once again living in a legal limbo under investigation for five years and that plea deal negotiated for months by his lawyers and a Trump-appointed lead prosecutor now in doubt after federal judge Mary Ellen Noriega, also appointed by Trump, refused to sign off on it yesterday. Today, the terms of that deal were revealed, Politico obtaining a copy of it and a source authenticating it for ABC. The document describes the huge sums Hunter Biden was earning from his overseas business dealings in Ukraine, China, and Romania, noting that Hunter continued to earn handsomely and spend wildly, making some $2.6 million in 2018 alone, spending almost all of it that year while in the throes of addiction. The key problem that led the judge to derail the deal? Paragraph 15, immunity, where prosecutors agree not to prosecute Biden for any federal crimes relating to the facts investigators had uncovered. When Judge Noriega asked if the president's son would be immune from prosecution for other possible crimes, including any related to his foreign business dealings, the prosecutor said no. But Biden's lawyer then threatening to rip up the deal. Both sides seeing their long-fought negotiations fall apart in front of their eyes in dramatic fashion. Judge Noriega insisting she wouldn't be a rubber stamp on their agreement. Hunter Biden eventually pleading not guilty for now. A teenage girl from Arizona who had been missing for four years shows up at a police station in Montana and says no one hurt her. Arcana Wentworth has the latest in this stunning update. Tonight, a stunning discovery. Nearly four years after Arizona 14-year-old Alicia Navarro vanished from her home, police say she walked into a Montana police station near the Canadian border, identified herself and asked to be taken off a list of missing children. Police releasing this FaceTime conversation with the now 18-year-old. Did anybody hurt you in any way? No, no one hurt me. Okay, because, uh, you know, our goal is we just want to make sure that you're safe. She is by all accounts safe, she is by all accounts healthy, and she is by all accounts happy. Navarro's disappearance sparked a massive search. Her mother said Alicia, who is on the autism spectrum, had left a note saying she'd run away. She said she feared her daughter had been lured by an online predator. Tonight, police say Alicia has been reunited with her family. In this Facebook video, her mother calling it a miracle. For everyone who has missing loved ones, I want you to use this case as an example. That miracles do exist and never lose hope and always fight. And Juju, authorities say they consider Alicia a victim. They also say this is just the beginning of this investigation to determine if there's any criminal element. Juju? Cannon Wentworth, thank you. Now to the war in Ukraine. Ukraine is stepping up its counteroffensive, pushing in two directions in the south. Russian President Vladimir Putin acknowledged today that the fighting has intensified, but said Russia has repelled the attacks. ABC's Ian Panel has more from Kyiv. Tonight, a U.S. official confirming to ABC News that the Ukrainian counteroffensive is ramping up, with large-scale assaults across the front lines. Here, special operations forces ambushing Russian soldiers near Kherson in the south, shot within the last two weeks. And in the east, Ukrainian assault troops in action, they say near Bakhmut, where important advances are being made. President Zelensky posting a video tonight of his troops in a newly liberated, strategically important village in the southeast. But there are conflicting reports about how successfully the counteroffensive is going. Pro-Russian media releasing these images, claiming a significant loss of Ukrainian lives and equipment, including American-made fighting vehicles. Defense Secretary Austin saying Ukraine having to go slowly through stiff Russian defenses. They fought hard. They've been working their way to get through the minefields and other obstacles. Uh, but they still have uh, a lot of combat power. Today, Vladimir Putin also saying the battles have increased significantly. And we have much more still to get to ahead. Coming up, the fight to put out a major fire tearing the Adriatic coast of Croatia and shedding light on a story often forgotten, a look inside a film that showcases the promises broken by the U.S. and the Lakota's fight to regain their sacred land. Here in Poland, 
here in Kentucky. No match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Hiroshima, I'm Brick Clenet. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And we're tracking several headlines around the world. Chaos in Niger after supporters of a coup set fire to the headquarters of the ruling party. Cars were set ablaze as the army command declared its backing for the takeover carried out by soldiers of the presidential guard. The soldiers said in a late night televised address that president had been stripped of power and the republic's institutions suspended, marking the seventh coup in the West and Central Africa since 2020. Thousands of Israelis opposed to the judicial overhaul sought by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu took to the streets a few days after Parliament passed the first of the changes. The new rules trim Supreme Court powers to overrule government actions and raise fears for the integrity of Israel's 75-year-old democracy. And Croatia has been battling a major fire on the Adriatic coast and deployed hundreds of firefighters while dumping water on the flames. Croatia is just the latest country in Europe battling the effects of scorching dry weather that has triggered wildfires in many regions. June was the hottest month on record in the 174-year history of temperature monitoring. And July appears on track to break that record. Our next guest is bringing to light a powerful story often overlooked by the history books. His new film, Lakota Nation versus United States, catalogs the promises broken by the U.S. and the Lakota's fight to regain their sacred lands in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Take a look. Much of what we've learned about the battle for the plains comes from what we've seen in Hollywood movies. When we saw the Indian defending his land, we cheered for the white man's soldiers. The best way to kill people is to dehumanize them, right? To make them into caricatures. And the film's director, Jesse Shortpole, joins me now. Jesse, thanks for taking time to share this story with us. Oh, thank you so much. Happy to be here. I know you grew up only a mile from a reservation in South Dakota, yet you say for much of your life you had no understanding of the history of the land that you grew up on. Tell us about what you came to learn, including your own grandfather's connection to the dispute over the Black Hills. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I grew up just as any other uh, kid in America and in South Dakota. Um, but I, I quickly discovered that something wasn't right or there was something missing because I had a last name, an indigenous last name, Shortbull. But I didn't understand where that name came from 
I didn't understand that there was tension between uh, the Oglala tribes that I grew up around and non non Oglala people. That put me on a pursuit to find history that was not given to me. Uh, it took a lot of a, a, a lifetime to try and understand how I, you know, fit into this and how the why, why we are the things are the way they are today sure and so much of that history is both hidden and dark you know I didn't realize that in 1980 the US Supreme Court ordered over a hundred million dollars to be paid to the Great Sioux Nation because of the broken treaty so with interest that sum is now around two billion dollars but despite the poverty uh, the Great Sioux Nation still refuses the money saying the land was never for sale tell us about that yeah no I, I mean it, it's it's center to Lakota worldview and that worldview is it's hard to sell something like selling a piece of yourself how can you sell a piece of yourself as one of our subjects in the documentary so eloquently put and that's something that our tribes have been adamant about refusing but there's sometimes there's something more and that's the connection to the land which is inherent to our identity you know, when we talk about stolen land, we often hear about reparations, right? But you argue that that may not be enough. Um, so what does restorative justice look like? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of opportunities um, that can help establish um, uh, the Ocheti Shakoin tribes back within their relationship with their ancestral homelands or their homelands decreed by treaty. And a lot of that is looking at federal lands and public lands and how we can enhance or figure out a way to create a path moving forward to make this right, make this injustice right and try to fix it. You know, woven throughout the film, um, the visual, stirring visuals of the beautiful shots of the sky, rivers, and nature that make up the Black Hills. Why is it that giving voice to the land itself important to the story? And take us through your decision in your filmmaking to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, my co-director, Laura, and I, uh, we really wanted to try to let the land speak. And, you know, obviously we can't interview the land, we can't set up lights or anything, but there is something profound in the stunning imagery that we have of this beautiful part of the country. And whatever language is embedded in those images, we really wanted to enhance to try and let it speak for itself. Well, the film is a triumph, Jesse Shortbull. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your story with us. And Lakota Nation versus United States is out in theaters now. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you so much. And still to come, she created a colorful character known for transforming into colors of the pride flag. I got a chance to talk to the author of The Queer Chameleon, our TikTok guest of the week. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? 
Yes. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We turn now to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. You know, when you hear about a chameleon going viral online, this may not be what comes to mind. Author and creator Amy Wilson is behind the popular cartoon Queer Chameleon. The colorful character is known for transforming into the colors of the pride flag and talks about queer experience. Let's take a quick look. Are you a gal? No. Are you a boy? No. I'm just a person. I am. A person or a chameleon? That's the question. And joining us now all the way from the UK is Amy. Welcome to the show, Amy. Hey, thanks for having me. It's very adorable, a queer chameleon. Explain to us how you came up with this concept. Uh, it actually came from a different uh, idea that I had during COVID, um, which was like a web comic about animals that were dealing with sort of anxieties. Um, and I did one that was about a chameleon and it was sort of based on my own experience coming out where it sort of accidentally turned the color of the pride flag. Um, but then the other chameleon just sort of said, I'm proud of you. And that comic sort of blew up. And then I realized that there was potentially another idea in it. Um, and I got onto TikTok and it just, it exploded. I love that. And so let's talk about your book, Queer Chameleon and Friends. These comics are essentially a snapshot of some of the elements of LGBTQ life. Did you draw from your own experiences for this? It was a real mix. I think um, because I'm, I'm, so I'm bisexual, um, I have, I guess, that experience and that perspective, but I really wanted to make it as broad as possible. So I spoke to people in the community, friends, you know, family, and try to cover sort of as many different parts of the community so that people felt like they were seen across the whole book. I love that the animation allows you to tackle sensitive topics like coming out, as you suggested, identity, which can be all over the rainbow, sexual orientation, as well as stereotypes. Why is it important for you to address these struggles using the cartoon? I think it's a fiercely um, discussed topic like across all the different experiences in the community. And I think sometimes it can be um, challenging to really articulate those things. And also you look at the person who's saying them and you obviously just take into account what their perspective is. So I think sort of making it simple, making it bright and colorful, just makes it a little bit easier to understand and even to kind of give to people who are not close to the community, it makes it really simple for them to understand as well. It also occurs to me that that might just be turning down the temperature on some of these hot button issues. Now, here in the States, we know that book bans in libraries and classrooms are one of those hot button issues all across the United States. What is your message to, I don't know, authority figures, lawmakers, administration people who challenge your book and others that have LGBTQ plus content? I think it's looking at actually what the messages are inside the books, because I think people see it as a threat. They see it as something that is damaging to people, children, but actually ultimately what the books talk about is things like acceptance, um, learning about other people, learning about other people's experiences and perspectives. And I don't know why that would be a bad message for anybody to read. And do you have an age group that you're looking at? And, and obviously you're not just targeting the LGBTQ plus community. This is about empathy too. What do you hope people take away? from the book? Um, to learn more about each other. I think that's the, really, there are things that I learned making the book. Like I had a really narrow understanding of like LGBTQI plus issues, even just from like being a 32 year old woman. <laughs> and so I think just taking that moment to kind of have a look at the different comics and just think actually there's probably more I could learn about these people. Well, Amy, thank you for joining us. Thanks for sharing your stories. And we can all pre-order Queer Chameleon and Friends wherever books are sold. Thanks so much. Thank you. And that's our show for tonight. I'm in for Lindsay Davis. I'm Juju Chang. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. Of course, you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, abcnews.com. Good night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in